very good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Rashli from the medical team of US. A very warm welcome to all the panelists and delegates in this talk show, The Green Studio. I'm wishing all the saviors present over here with us today a very happy Doctor's Day. Like water has been a savior to mankind since years. Similarly, sulfur and urias have played an integral part in the T2D management. So let's explore the reasons behind the evergreen status. Also, I would like to keep you informed that being a responsible leader in diabetes care, USV has set up a state-of-art manufacturing facility that works on the principles of sustainability, such as paperless manufacturing, tree plantation, rainwater harvesting, usage of solar energy, reduced carbon dioxide emission, and zero liquid wastage. With this, I would like to invite, and it's my great privilege to welcome our eminent course coordinator today, Dr. Nandita. She's the director and consultant diabetologist at Dr. Ramachandra's Diabetes Hospital. Her alma mater includes all across UK and India, like University of Cambridge, CMC Vellur, Cardiff University, and also the Great Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. She has also been associated with the Royal College of Physicians, Glasgow. She's a member of numerous professional bodies, organizing member of several conferences, very active in research, has several international publications, is a co-investigator in many drug files. It's great to have you here with us today, ma'am. So let's talk green. Over to you, Dr. Nandita. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayushi. And a very good evening to everyone. Happy Doctor's Day, first of all, to all the doctors present here. And uh, of course, uh, I have to at the outset thank USV for arranging this green studio event and to be part of it. Um, it's um, on the occasion of um, um, Doctor's Day. Um, so, of course, what uh, we will be discussing today is, as the name indicates, it's called the green studio for um, a reason. The reason being that we're going to be discussing for a change, not just diabetes, but also something to do with environmental sciences and uh, what we can do as doctors, what little role we may play in um, improving the environment. So uh, today it's a pleasure for me to be part of this panel and uh, I have with me Dr. Alok um, Kanungo, Dr. Ganapati Bantwal and uh, Dr. Mayur Agarwal. Um, I will first briefly introduce um, the uh, panelists. Um, Dr. Ayushi, will you be able to put up a slide on uh, yes, each of the yes. panelists? Yeah, thank you. Next slide, please. We have with us uh, very eminent um, uh, leading physicians and diabetologists from all over India today. Dr. Alok Kanungo, who has uh, done his PhD from uh, Sweden and a Fellowship of Diabetes from Stockholm. He is a chief consultant diabetologist and managing di director of Kids Institute in Bhubaneswar, Odisha. Um, he has uh, got many um, uh, laurels to his credit, and he is a principal investigator for many trials and an NIH project with genetic studies. Scientific member of European Association of Study of Diabetes, uh, winner of the Sankalp Forum Samridhi Enterprises Recognition Grant um, UK. Uh, he's also uh, got many other awards to his credit, like the Corporate Odisha Award 2012 and uh, the Best Paper Award at the Novo Nordisk Update. We also have with us, can we have uh, the next uh, Dr. Ganpati Bantwal, who is uh, Professor and Head of Endocrinology from St. John's Medical College in Bangalore. Uh, Vice President of the Karnataka Endocrine Society, past President Endocrine Society of India, um, past Treasurer, Karnataka Endocrine Society. Sir has got many awards to his credit as well. And um, most importantly, he's also published uh, many publications in both national and international journals. Mo most importantly, he is a teacher par excellence. Thank you. Next is Dr. Can we have the next slide? Yeah. Um, we also have with us Dr. Mayur Agarwal. Pleasure to have you here today. He is the uh, medical director and consultant endocrinologist at Hormone India Diabetes and Endocrine Center in Bhopal. Um, Dr. Mayur is also a consultant endocrinologist at Apollo Bhopal. He is um, uh, secured the first rank in his MBBS examination and uh, won several gold medals in medicine and um, young entrant of the year, entrant of the year at the RSSDI to 2022, best case report 2022 at RSSDI, 
Best India Award 2023 from the Honorable Minister of Science and Technology. Um, he is also, to his credit, he has launched the Diabetes Reversal Mission uh, with Doc Plix. And uh, uh, he is also an invited speaker at many forums. Thank you for joining us uh, today. So um, with that, we will now move on to the uh, topic of discussion, which is, like I said, um, initially we're going to be discussing, of course, we'll be moving on to science and um, talking about diabetes as such. But um, the first couple, uh, few minutes, we're going to be discussing about a little bit of something for a change, um, environmental science. So the first question um, will be, Shall I read it out, uh, Ayusha, or, or do you want to display the slide? I'll, I'll read it from here. The first question will be to Dr. Ganapati. So uh, what do you think are the challenges that we face today with uh, water preservation? And how, what are the approaches that you think will be the best for a more sustainable approach for um, water conservation? And what do you think that we as doctors can do to contribute for this cause, sir? Uh, yeah, right. Uh... One of the most challenges is water contamination. That is the pollution, pollution of uh, inland water that's mixing with sewages and uh, industrial pollutants. So this is one of the most important uh, challenges. The second challenge being you have global warming due to increased carbon dioxide emissions and which is leading to this El Nino effect. So you are seeing here a uh, lot of uh, 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 tornadoes, and some areas you're having very high temperatures with the groundwater becoming zero. Uh, then there's a lack of drought planning. So that's another important thing which is actually happening. You're getting a lot of rainfall, which should happen in say three months time in a single day. And we don't know what to do with that. So that's a problem we are seeing, which should have been spread over three months. Now it is we are getting in one or two days only. So this is the scenario we are seeing. Say just in Mangalore, I think we had a, 25 centimeters rain. Uh, after a long time, the same thing is happening in Bombay also. So probably because of this El Nino, we are not giving much concern towards the environment, the ozone effect. We are not looking into that. So what can we do as a doctor? Maybe we can participate in policy making. Uh, in the sense, we can be a part of that. For example, uh, NMC, National Medical Council, or the MCI has made it mandatory for all the medical colleges to have, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, recycling or re uh, units what, uh, in all the medical colleges. So this is a mandatory thing. The first thing they'll come in, they'll check, do you have that? So with this, you can actually reclaim the water which has been used for other purposes and we can use it for gardening or use it in the toilet, those things. So that's an, uh, one thing which has been done. And maybe education which would start from our, our clinic itself, maybe tell them to use in conservation, uh, tell the, I mean, uh, of course, part of government policy only should be telling all the farmers to use drip irrigation rather than the usual other type of irrigations where you use a lot of water. And also maybe change the type of plantation. Sugar canes require a huge amount of water. So probably try to lessen that so that's another thing which uh, we can tell. And then, of course, as a part of, uh, once again, governmental initiative, uh, what we can do is we can tell them, uh, don't use, uh, I mean, use water uh, uh, conservatively. Uh, use showers. Of course, don't use it for a long time because the showers versus using a bucket for taking bath, you consume more water when you use the buckets actually because you are taking a big amount of water and uh, using it showers with a smaller sprinkler which gives more effect so that's actually better yeah i right. think basically some uh, uh, you can say uh, education is an important and taking part in the governmental initiatives right thank you thank you so much sir, for um, explaining that so nicely um the next question will go to dr alok sir so um so what do you feel we've all been uh, you know, we've faced one of the worst summers in some parts of India and um, hydration is something that most of us take for granted, I think, is uh, safe to say. I think many of us even forget to drink our water. So um, what is your opinion on the impact of hydration and overall health and um, promoting proper hydration? Water is life. 
as you say jala hi jibon means life is uh, water so i thank uh, osil and uh, team usb and nandita for conducting this and my friend ganapati and mayur so this is a very unique topic for doctors to approach what is the role of water and we all as doctors know that we sweat and there is a visible sweat and there is some invisible sweating in the summer when we are crossing here at 45 in odisha we have 2 liters or more invisible sweating is there and 1.5 liters or plus is visible sweating we have to replace that unless we do that this effect of heat and summer is much worse with us water has a very important role that is why dehydration kills dehydration is a killer by itself just the absence of adequate quantity of water so we should educate our patients as ganapati was telling they should be educated that water helps in nutrients and oxygen to your cells carrying the nutrients and oxygen to your cells by the dilution of the blood flushing bacteria from your bladder aiding digestion preventing constipation normalizing blood pressure cushioning joints protecting organs and tissues regulating body temperature and maintaining electrolyte and sodium potassium balance these are all vital things and uh, if we lack in water we go into a critical condition but in different age groups different quantity of water is required a child an adult young athlete a worker in the field somebody crossing stones in the mines all those people need different levels of water and an old person sitting at home his thirst comes down and he doesn't take adequate water so these are the medical issues that we have to address and these are social issues also many old people are discovered in a very bad stage just because lack of water and sodium low so our patients should be educated the clinic should have water purifiers and this uh, drinking water machines instead of having plastic bottles because plastic bottles with water should be discouraged because they are a bigger pollutant to the environment so in our hospitals also we have big machines where people take water in paper glasses and all those things we discourage plastic use so water has many uses it is life it is it is needed so drought may be uh, killing the um, this agriculture but uh, water lack also kills the human beings and animals so i have all those who are preserving water they have they should be regarded as life savers and there should be as uh, ganapati was telling the uh, stp this uh, all hospital ex- products are gone and cleared in uh, sewage treatment plant and fresh water comes out not for drinking but for gardening and other things so conservation of water is very important and this continues it is a long talk only on water itself and its merits thank you thank you thank you sir um in fact you've already uh, touched upon some of the points on um, preservation and what we as doctors can do in the healthcare setting as well but f- to further elaborate on that uh, over to you dr mayur what do you think uh, are the best um, you know sort of strategies that we can use in the healthcare setting um, uh, to play our roles um, in this um, uh, water conservation so uh, nicely question put forward so first of all let me thank you and all the panelists and especially team usc for organizing this involving me and taking up such an important topic and out of the box or because we always discuss just the medicine and happy doctors day to all the doctors who are listening to us so the question is uh, what are the strategies so if you see most of the hospital are using somewhere around 800 to 1000 liters per 
day per bed IPD. So this can be reduced even some are using 500. So this even can be reduced to 350 or 400. So what we need is to use less water without affecting the functionality. So how this can be done? So there are some points I'll be discussing. Firstly, the taps like you see, you see the taps are running like that only. They are not used. So low flow taps can be used or something like you see in train which automatically gets shut or even better you can use some flow restrictor installers you can use then sensor taps are something which are available and they are not very costly so you can use that then something uh, waterless urinals leak detection is something important which i find that especially in government sector because the things are not kept to the that proper level so identifying fixing taps pipes that is important maintenance of ro plant then rainwater harvesting is something which is important so this will conserve the water the groundwater the roof water that is important then gray water cycling so what is that gray water gray water is basically non-contaminated wastewater from the sinks so this can be used for the toilets floor cleaning so all those and then laundry is something which is very important in hospital ipd settings because much of these uh, clothes and everything then hospital uh, especially ipds uh, beddings and then from the this uh, surgery uh, surgical part so all those things are used so saving water during the laundry that is that can be done very easily so use the full loads like if your uh, washing machine has 15 kgs keep the clothes for 15 kgs don't put just the 5 kgs and then decrease the number of cycle decrease the timing that can be done then steam sterilizers can be converted to the vacuum sterilizer and very important you should educate and raise the awareness between the healthcare professions and the staffs and at last keep monitoring and keep track data analysis is really important which will help you to improve yourself so all these things can be taken together and this will really impact Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mayur. Very well uh, summarized. Um, we will now, of course, move on. We can't uh, continue this without uh, moving on to the topic of discussion, which is diabetes, which is uh, what we all specialize in, finally. Um, so, of course, recent data, there's, we, we know that India is one of the diabetic capitals of the world. And uh, we also know that we have exploding number of people uh, with diabetes. Um, recent data from the ICMR has also shown that um, the number of people with pre-diabetes is also increasing and, in, and increasing more so. We have, in fact, published data just recently showing that it's not just in the urban areas, but also, more importantly, there's growing numbers of both diabetes and pre-diabetes in the rural areas as well. And this is a very important uh, you know, point of concern because um, pre-diabetes is literally a ticking time bomb. These are people who are almost waiting to convert to diabetes. And we know that once there is the onset of type 2 diabetes, it is a progressive uh, condition and um, can result in life-threatening complications as well. So um, that being said, um, so Dr. Alok, sir, um, to you, the, the question is, do you believe that um, screening uh, for pre-diabetes um, should become a routine in clinical practice? And, and do you think that um, just checking a blood glucose is almost as important and can be termed as one of the vital signs? What is your opinion on this? Absolutely. It has already been being treated as a fifth vital sign other than the all other four. Because this ICMR data that has been recently published is really astounding. We all knew that it is not following any arithmetic or geometric progression rules in increase in diabetes. But if this increases like this 24% in last two years, then and particularly COVID has added to the new diabetes incidence so much then a time for screening of all population above certain age is very essential. Particularly, equal number of people are waiting to be diabetic in the pre-diabetic stage. Anybody having a 100 plus blood glucose and whatever the PP may be should be taken into lifestyle modification and other things. So in my practice also, in our hospital also, we encourage family screening. Those particularly who are the risk candidates, risk candidates are they whose family has a diabetic population. First screen them for pre-diabetes. Then kith and kins and others should be treated. Quality history taking will ensure 
proper screening method and india in uh, your chennai and other places huge money is spent for screening and all those things your organization mohan's organization all of you do a lot of screening here in odisha also government of odisha is doing a lot of screening through government of india support and previously we thought that tribal areas which is plenty in odisha do not have diabetes in 60s when ahuja and bibi tripathi surveyed koraput the tribal rich place they didn't find any diabetic maybe 0.01% now i have the large patients from koraput malkangiri mbada these are all remote tribal districts because government of orissa is doing door to door uh, pre diabetes or diabetes screening so that is detecting a lot many new diabetics and pre diabetics and pre diabetics if you know that if you give the proper lifestyle modification and you give the metformin whenever required then you prevent diabetes for a pretty long time and maybe 50% of them will go to diabetes but that is a huge number and we also know that in pre diabetes suppose retinopathy is 14% whereas in diabetes it is 21% so pre diabetics do get complications so it is very important to detect pre diabetic patients and to keep them in track with lifestyle modification diet modification exercise and all those things so this atom bomb which has started kicking has already started exploding in some areas it will still explode further if you do not take adequate steps at this stage so screening is very very important absolutely thank you sir so um, so so called opportunistic screening where we uh, utilize the in clinic when they when we see patients you know to, to sort of declaring it as a vital sign would actually go a long way um of course I'm, and also i think for resource saving it is always um, a useful tool to use the risk score um like you said family history obesity with the risk factors so if we, there is a non invasive risk score which uh, can be used at any clinic um uh, doctors who are listening today can actually go up and uh, look this up there's something called the indian diabetes risk score which is a non invasive very simple tool can be used in your clinic it will hardly take a few minutes and you can actually do what is called um screening of patients who are at risk so that your yield is also higher and there's resource saving as well especially in our part of the world um that being said we know that once patients once a person does convert to diabetes treatment becomes the best option and um, we recently the rssdi also had a huge program which was just about a year ago um, and i was um, you know uh, happy to be part of the task force of that which is called the test track and treat um, so once testing was for screening and testing and then track people um, before they convert but with lifestyle modification and once they've converted we treat the diabetes to reduce the risk of complications so it was called test track and treat it was headed by uh, dr bansi sabul sir as well um but we know that as a population the indian phenotype is mostly insulinopenic and um we do have the so called like dr yagnik sir uh, uh, you know his theory of the thin fat indian um recently there has also been a publication um where we also know that the diagnosis or the classification rather the types of diabetes is not as simple as what we you know sort of have been learning over the years it may not be just as straightforward as a type 1 and a type 2 of course we also have the other types but um recently the classification of high uh, disc glycemia if i can, if i could um, call it the classification itself is sort of evolving um so recently there is also a publication by dr sanjay kalra in which he has used the term the uh, the fulcrum approach for type 2 diabetes and what this means is where we can in clinic um use more of an experience based prescription rather than just evidence based because many of us uh, know that we are dealing with large number of patients with diabetes um but um, over to you sir uh, ganapati sir what is your opinion of this fulcrum based approach where we sort of classify patients to insulinopenic or obese and based on the so called actually what uh, the article actually says very nicely says um 
either they're anabolic, catabolic, or eubolic, based on which we can actually tailor make our prescriptions, um, uh, so so-called patient-centric approach. What is your opinion on this, sir? Yeah, it looks like a good suggestion. Uh, like if you feel that the patient is losing weight, catabolic, then your choice of treatment will differ. For example, if he's losing a lot of uh, weight, then maybe insulin will be the treatment of choice in these patients. And if he's not losing that much weight, then probably we can use the sulfonylureas because they can stimulate the insulin and uh, help him to regain the catabolic things which has been lost. And then in the eubolic, you could actually use medications like metformin. And maybe also in some cases, we can even use an SUs also in those types, a DPP-4 inhibitors like that you can use. And in the maladaptive anabolic uh, uh, people, you can actually use a GLP-1 or for that matter, even an SGLT-2 because they are all uh, overweight, uh, malad maladaptive because... Uh, you are having more fat in these type of patients. A GLP or an SGLT2 will be useful. So it looks promising, but it requires more validation. So like you have a cluster approach. So similarly, this is also coming up. More uh, uh, validation is required before we start this, but it's a useful tool in the clinical setting. Yes, to sort of individualize therapy, I think. Yeah. Um, Sir, now, um, uh, no, I think the next question is to Dr. Mayur. Um, what is your opinion? So we are now in an era where we have at our disposal multiple agents. Um, just about a couple of decades ago, the management of type 2 diabetes was absolutely uh, sort of simple because all we had were a couple of agents to choose from and a failure of which just um, move over to insulin. Now we have a whole armamentarium of drugs. We have the newer agents like the SGLT2s, the DPP4s, uh, incretin-based therapy like uh, GLP1s and a uh, whole array of them available. Um, however, having said that, um, the sun has not set on the SUs. We still, um, in our daily practice, find ourselves prescribing um, SUs in I think almost every other patient that we see, mainly because we, like I, uh, has already been discussed, we are an insulinopenic population and it's probably not practical to be treating patients without SUs. So what is your opinion on uh, the role of the modern SUs? Of course, we have the first and second generation SUs. So what do you, where do you think the modern SUs actually fit into the management of type 2 diabetes in today's um, era? Yeah, so th this again is a nice question, I would say. Now, as more and more drugs are coming up, we have more drugs to deal with. That's a big advantage. Now we can treat the patient in multiple ways. Multiple pathophysiology can be taken. Again, but there is a problem that which drug to choose, when to choose, and it causes confusion. Coming back to the question regarding modern-day sulfonylurea. So if you see the guideline, it very clearly says that, firstly, you have to see for, you have to follow the lifestyle modification, followed by metformin followed by like this was a uh, last year guideline this year they have put down the metformin even down so lifestyle plus minus metformin and followed by if the patient has ACVD risk factors or already established ACVD you have to move for GLP-1 or SGLT-2 inhibitor but where do you put sulfonylurea so if you see guideline they don't specifically use sulfonylurea and initially it was written like for the low cost and all those things but you see the modern by modern sulfonylurea we mean gl uh, glimepiride glyclazide basically and to some extent glipizide so there are some advantages, some disadvantages, plus point and negative to the modern sulfonylurea. First coming to the plus point, the mechanism of action that is, as you have rightly said, we are insulinopenic. So these are insulin secretocoques. So they will actually act on our population. Secondly, affordability. Now it's off patent. So that is the reason we will not have CVOT trials, obviously. So that's a big advantage that affordability where most of the Indian population earn somewhere around 10,000, right? So for them, this becomes a very good drug. Then safe. If you leave just the hypoglycemia, that also if you use judiciously, the patient will not develop hypoglycemia. So they are safe. Now coming to another advantage that is combination. The pill burden reduces and the patient has uh, satisfaction that his glycemia is controlled with one or two pill. So that's a big advantage. The negative point with modern sulfonin ureas are that we don't have dedicated uh, CVOT trials and but we have seen that they act and they if not 
कार्डियो प्रोटेक्टिव एटलीस्ट दे आर कार्डियो न्यूट्रल कमिंग टू दिस कैरोना ट्रायल सो वी हैव सीन दैट वर्सेस लीना ग्लिप्टिन इट वाज एस एस एफ एस लीना ग्लिप्टिन सो आई बिलीव दे कैन बी गिवन एंड इवन इफ यू सी इफ यू ट्रैक डाउन यूर ऑन प्रिस्क्रिप्शन ऑलमोस्ट फिफ्टी और सिक्सटी परसेंट ऑफ यूर पेशेंट वुड बी रिसीविंग एनी ऑफ द सेल्फोन इन यूरिया सो दैट इज वेयर आई वुड लाइक टू प्लेस दीज सेल्फोन इन यूरिया सेट प्रेजेंट absolutely uh, rightly said i don't think um, like i i mentioned earlier i don't think it's practical for us to be um, shunning away the uh, su's um so uh, dr alok uh, back to you um in your opinion of course dr mayur has very nicely uh, discussed the uh, benefits uh, of the modern su's but uh, in your opinion how do you un- how do you feel um, this should be sort of exp- do you feel that this should be explained to the patients and um, should patients also be aware um, with with you know uh, we have uh, available information just at the click of a button so patients do google and uh, come and ask us questions all the time uh, but what is your opinion on this sir uh, i must be regularly using more than 1 lakh patients every day glimipiride every day they buy glimipiride and they use it i hardly get complications the vehicle mercedes if driven by a poor driver will crash hypoglycemia is that it will not give you crash if you know the difference between 0.5 1 2 3 some give you 8 i don't uh, like that why do you squeeze the beta cell so much if it is not working in 2 it may not work in four there are other drugs to help you so sulfonylureas in my practical experience of last 30 40 years are safe they are convenient euglycemic effect is highest in sulfonylureas you want to reduce blood glucose sulfonylureas ureas may or may not with metformin work very well than any other newer drugs then you achieve the target of euglycemia you avoid the glucotoxicity patient friendly safety as mayur has told cardio and renal safety may not be at par with linagliptin but we don't get much otherwise lot of these people would have died of cardiac failure heart failure these the hospitalized for heart failure nothing happens like that when uh, when uh, safola came i don't want to use the brand name or that uh, some oil came mustard oil was very badly thrust that this is the worst oil in the world now what is the condition now everybody is eating mustard oil and we know it's good quality even we are eating ghee desi ghee which was banned so badly when others started coming entering to the market there is an economics behind all the products science behind all the products but in a country like india where even today glibenclamide takes a major share of self prescription or chemist based prescription in india lakhs and lakhs of people use glibenclamide they are still better they are surviving so i should strongly say glimipiride or safe sulfonylureas should be in use till we get a cheaper and better product than them you have always diamonds is there gold is there but silver is also available for some ladies for a pounji for the leg give them that pleasure of uh, ornaments why ban these products thank you bye right. very nicely uh, said sir like you said silver is also available and i think when it comes to the issues like they say old is gold um, we've been using it for years together and um, i think glimipride has taken light uh, has come to sort of uh, been in the limelight recently uh, ganapati sir what is your opinion on the modern issues and uh, can you throw some light on the newer data that we have uh with modern issues especially glimipride and um, now that um, you know uh, alok sir has also brought up glibenclamide just you know out of the box if uh, what is your opinion about the newer issues and the older issues versus the older issues with the risk of hypoglycemia and the so called rebound uh, 
hyperglycemia that we sometimes see when we um, try to make that shift as well. Over to you, sir. Yeah, actually, I think uh, tolbutamide first brought the bad name to the SU community, you can say. And then glibenclamide, uh, that also brought uh, disrepute actually to the SU. But then uh, what has been found is uh, glimipiride actually helps in ischemic preconditioning. So that's there, which is not there with the other SUs. Of course, it's there for uh, glicoside also. And then we had recently data from the Carolina trial where they actually, it was an RCT itself, where they compared it with linagliptin and you found at least it's neutral, CV neutral. Then there has been recent data on uh, actually a study done by, it's a, you can say uh, a study done by Hugh et al. He looked into around 21,000 inpatients who had diabetes and uh, heart failure. And he found that around 609 patients had uh, were using glimipiride. And then out of which I think 500 uh, patients, he could do a propensity score matching with the other OHS. And when he actually did this, he found that a significant reduction in mortality, hospitalization for heart failure, uh, MI, uh, hospitalization for acute MI, acute stroke, which was quite significant. This happened with glimipiride. More so, it happened with the, it was dose dependent also. You, you are using, say, 2 milligram or 4 milligram. You got still better results compared with 1 milligram. This is what has been found in that, which came as a surprise, in fact, for them also. And they claim that this could be because of its effect on uh, epoxy eicosat uh, trianoic acid, which has a beneficial effects on the heart. So this could be the reason by which glimipiride could have a beneficial effect. And also, uh, it can reduce IL-34, which is positively associated with uh, insulin resistance. And... Uh, IRAP, which is an insulin-regulated amino peptidase, a protein linked to GLUT4 upregulation, that's upregulated actually by this. So these are something new things which are actually coming with SUs, especially glimipiride, and its beneficial effect on uh, uh, CV outcomes, probably via these mechanisms. As you know, insulin resistance uh, can, uh, worsening of that, in fact, can lead to more atherogenesis, etc. And by reducing that, uh, it's also been uh, helping to prevent the CB outcomes. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Mayur, we are now, I think the management of type 2 diabetes has evolved over the years, isn't it? And um, so have the guidelines. They have been changing. Um, uh, the, the whole concept of uh, managing a patient with type 2 diabetes is overall now the so-called patient-centric approach where we take into account not just the blood glucose, but many other factors, including the comorbidities, the risk of hypoglycemia, the age, duration of diabetes, and a lot of emphasis on the so-called CRM, the cardiorenal metabolic uh, protection. Um, and yet the SUs, the modern SUs like Lemipride are very widely used. So what, where do you think um, uh, we can place the SUs in this so-called patient-centric approach uh, when we have a, you know, when uh, we have a patient sitting across the table and we decide to initiate Lemipride, where do you think it actually fits in in that patient-centric approach? Yeah. So as I have already mentioned, the guideline don't actually put sulfonylurea somewhere uh, where these type of patient you should be using that. So it's like an outliner where you can or you may not use where other drugs also you can use. So whatever guidelines you mostly we follow the ADA. So it will say that if the patient have some risk factor or already a CVD has been there, you have to use uh, uh, this SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist. And if the risk of hypoglycemia, then some drugs and otherwise a almost to the rightmost corner they have put in last uh, year ADA. This year they have even removed that for the cost effectiveness. In clinical practice, that is what I want to tell where actually we should be putting sulfonyl ureas where the guidelines actually don't mention. Like you have newly patient diabetic who is uh, having weight loss. Ideally, he should be on insulin, but how many patients you will get who will agree to start insulin right at the beginning? So you see now so many patients directly coming to you with HBNC of somewhere 10, 11 due to some weight loss. Maybe they have lost 10 kg. So for them who are not willing for insulin, a sulfonyl urea will be very, very good choice. Then very high sugars where you don't want to put an SGLT2 inhibitor because it will increase the risk of ketosis. I've seen at least 10 patients with euglycemic ketoacidosis, right? So 
there you can put a sulfonyl urea otherwise let's say a patient of balenopostitis due to balenopostitis he got his blood sugar checked and he was diagnosed as diabetic so that time again you would not be putting him on an SGLT2 inhibitor and the sulfonyl urea will be acting very well then these type of patient who have blood sugars very high they often have triglycerides also very high like in the range of 400 500 right so there you don't want to put a dpp4 inhibitor or a glp1 receptor agonist because it can increase the risk of pancreatitis right so for them also a sulfonyl urea would be very very good again we have multiple data which shows the sulfonyl urea will drop the sugars much earlier than your sglt2 inhibitor and as already mentioned twice about the cvot it is safe may not be protective but at least safe for sure so even those patients who have heart failure also you can give it's not like a contraindicated drug and we have this a very big randomized control trial carmelina which shows that it is as safe as linagliptin so that is where i would like that you can use sulfonyl urea and we have been using it it's just the guidelines which are more confusing everyone well said. Thank you. Um, sir, Dr. Alok, sir, your opinion. We, this is actually an open question for um, all the panelists here today. But um, uh, Alok, sir, we'll hear from you first. Your opinion, the recent guidelines have actually recommended that um, all patients with uh, pre-diabetes or even type 2 diabetes should be screened for uh, fatty liver or uh, NAFLD. Um, so the term is, of course, also evolving. Um, what is your opinion on this? And um, do you think that every patient should go through a screening for uh, fatty liver disease? Because to confirm fatty liver disease, you may require a fibro scan or a biopsy. Ultrasound informs that there is fatty liver. But to confirm that, you need further investigation. All patients should not undergo that. Now we get almost 90% ultrasound reports which says grade 1, grade 2 fatty liver. Fatty liver is possibly linked to fatty belly. Mm -hmm. All these people have pot, pot belly, many of them. When you can see fat from outside, it is very difficult. Why should you go so deep into investigating it? Reduce the fat, give him lifestyle things. Give him other things. This saroglitazer is not working. The other pyoglitazer is working. Recommended. Somehow or other, such a good drug was almost rejected from Indian market. Now it is coming back as a drug or a severe in fatty liver disease. So those who have symptoms, those who have got high grade suspicion of fatty liver in the ultrasound, should be investigated through a gastroenterologist. It is not our job to go for piercing a needle to the liver or going for a fibro scan and other things. We can recommend a gastroenterology checkup for those people, but it is not a mass recommendation. Only ultrasound should be good enough. And some therapeutic approach, if there is indigestion, if there is other problems, give some enzymes, do something, Add metformin, add pioglitazone, and ask for a good lifestyle modification so that the patient load will come down. That right. is what. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Ganapati, sir, do you have anything to add to um, what you Yeah, in said, fact, uh, what we are doing in our hospital is uh, we actually screen for all of them. We do what is known as a FIP4 score. Yeah. You require an AST, ALT, and a platelet. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, platelet count. Platelet, yeah. And yeah, if it is less than uh, one point four three, we know it's fine. If it is more than two point six seven, we'll refer to an, a gastroenterologist. If it is in between, we'll suggest lifestyle measures. And uh, we, if we find that it's in the in between range, then we'll go for the fibro scan. And uh, so why we want to do is because uh, all these things is when a patient goes to the gastroenterologist is actually late, we'll have to find that patient is having a NAFL at the earlier stage itself. And uh, why? Wh what is the role of an endocrinologist here? Because insulin resistance is one of the components of the multiple hit uh, uh, pathways of the pathogenesis of NAFL. And uh, you know that insulin resistance is associated with increased cardiovascular risk. 
so we actually in fact screen for uh, other things also when you have a, a NAFLD which is quite significant so we need to intervene early and Dr. Alok has told us uh, yes we can use pyoglitazone in this type of patients but the moment you find the fibrous scan score is more than 12 we'll refer to the gastroenterologist because then they have a major role but then in between less than eight we can tell them lifestyle management or you can start them on uh, pyoglitazone and see the two drugs which have been useful one is a semaglutide right now and uh, pyoglitazone we can actually see whether we can use either of them uh, so we could intervene early rather than waiting for it to go more advanced by which time it is actually delayed we are finding even uh, say thin people a lot of fat because we have this ectopic fat deposition we miss a lot of these type of patients so our role is do that so we have made it now mandatory in our hospital at least my department i tell them do a fib score and then we decide how to go about if it is less than 1.43 we don't do anything more than six point uh, two point six seven refer to gastro in between lifestyle measures C for six months no implement refer to them right i think uh, the fib score is again a very useful tool screening tool to sort of pick up um, patients at risk mm -hmm. and i think screening for fatty liver disease is more about screening for metabolic obesity more yes. than um, and cardiovascular risk which translates right. to cardiovascular risk ultimately Correct. Uh, yeah. dr mayur do you have um, anything that you'd like to share in this regard um, I would like to add something uh, as well, like if you would have read even the uh, latest guideline till the last update uh, week or two weeks ago, it was ADA says that OTPT if raise you screen, otherwise you can calculate the FIB score. That is okay. FIB score includes adult OTPT age and the platelet count. But because of high prevalence, I believe we should be screening somewhere 70 to 80 percent of the patient have that and it will help them to have more. They'll, it will motivate them to have more of lifestyle modification because all this that is why the name in fact has been changed to Merfeld metabolic associated fatty liver disease because all this obesity, diabetes, pre-diabetes, insulin resistance, Merfeld, everything is have the same pathophysiology. So if you say that this is going to happen and maybe you develop fibrosis or even you can develop cirrhosis the patient will take it more carefully more enthusiastically and will follow the lifestyle measures more rigorously in that way it may help that is what i believe absolutely so maffeld obesity type 2 diabetes and it's all basically one continuum and uh, one it's basically the spectrum of the entire metabolic disease that we are seeing um, Dr. Aushi, uh, would you like to move on to the case study? I think we have a case discussion uh, planned at the end, isn't it? Yeah, correct, ma'am. Will you be able to project the slide on that or shall I just read out the case? Yeah, I think can you please have the slides? So now that we very nicely had a discussion so far and heard um, uh, the opinions of um, the panelists here, um, the last bit is now to move on, of course, uh, to a case study because we, we're all at the end of the clinicians and um, carrying this over to the clinic is what actually matters. Um, so this is a typical case scenario, nothing extraordinary about it, but uh, this is what we see in our everyday clinic. A 42-year-old man who has been referred for management of his uh, type 2 diabetes. He's been diabetic for the past two years. Uh, he has a positive family history of um, diabetes and hypertension. His father was a diabetic. Paternal grandfather was also diabetic. His current medication is he's on metformin. Um, so metformin monotherapy with lifestyle modification, uh, but he fails to follow up. So the patient um, does not, the frequency of follow up is not um, as good. Um, his labs reveal that his HPA1C is deranged 8.3% with a fasting of 184 and a postprandial of 272. Triglycerides are also elevated, which probably indicates further uh, reiterates his insulin resistance. Uh, HDL is 38, LDL is 84, blood pressure is 142 by 84, um, and his EGFR is at 90. So this, um, the, the million dollar question is what next after metformin? So um, this is a sort of, we have, like I'd mentioned earlier, we have a whole armamentarium of drugs available. We have many tools available just about to, couple of decades ago after metformin the only option that was available were the SUs but today in today's era we have many options available and choosing the right drug in the right patient initiating it at the right time keeping in mind various factors not just the hyper uh, not just the blood glucose um, is sort of like 
um, the art of uh, managing diabetes today. So um, I think we can start with um, you, Alok, sir. What do you think would be the, rest, uh, the best approach for this particular patient? And um, with this, if this patient is sitting across the table, what would be your next step, sir? I will uh, rather listen from Ganapati past. Then I will talk. Sure. Uh, okay, so the question is, how can modern SUs contribute to the overall management of the patient? Uh, yeah, so this patient, strong family history of diabetes, uh, we don't have a BMI, you know? Okay, so we don't have a BMI. Uh, no, so we don't. what we can actually do is, is there a role for SU in this? Yes, along with metformin, I may use a low-dose SU like glimepiride, 0.5 milligram. Uh, and because he's just two years diabetic, so yes, I will probably give that. But if that option was not there, maybe an SGLT2 inhibitor with uh, a metformin would have been my first choice. Uh, but then you can use an SU also. There is a role. Small, the, uh, the low dose ones, very minimal hypoglycemia if used properly. And also it could help in controlling the TG, which is happening because of the high blood glucose. So you control the glucose, the TG comes down indirectly, the HDL also improves. The moment the TG comes down, the HDL also shows a uh, better effect. And of course, for blood pressure, so he's written there uh, uncontrolled. Yeah, maybe I will be starting on either an ARB first choice was, and then maybe an ACE inhibitor in this type of patient. Yeah, there is a role. If we cannot use an SGLT2, I think I will use a low dose uh, glimepiride along with metformin. Same here. This patient has a fasting high postprandial high with high triglyceride. HbA1c 8.3 for last four months is not well controlled with metformin alone. And his eGFR is fairly good. Blood pressure is fluctuating because of blood sugar. So once we control blood sugar or plasma glucose, blood pressure will also come down. But as Ganapati has told, we can give something for that. But a combination drug of metformin with low dose glimepiride will be very good for this person because glimepiride is almost 24 hours, working for 24 hours. So one metformin with uh, glimepiride 0.5 will help in this patient. We can wait. He has waited for two years. We can wait for two months and see what is happening. And if things Im do not improve, even triglyceride doesn't improve, we add something for triglyceride. As it is 242 is a doubtful range for starting uh, any lip uh, statins or anything. We can wait. Lifestyle modification will reduce it. And I will only add glimepiride with metformin low dose. Right. Thank you, sir. Dr. Mayur, uh, what would be your approach? What is your opinion? Yeah, nothing much to add. I believe the mainly thing I would be looking at is weight, BMI. Yeah. If the patient is somewhere morbidly obese, I would not be very uh, confident to add a sulfonyl urea. But if the patient is losing weight, uh, I would be more happy to add a sulfonyl urea rather than other drugs. And then we know that uh, we have various, like if, let's say, because we have not, uh, here the data is not complete. We need to ask the question to patient also, what is his lifestyle? Let's say he's uh, having very erratic dietary pattern. So things would again change. A DPP-4 inhibitor would be a better choice at that time. So it depends on patient to patient. It's not a fixed pro forma that, okay, you will add that. But by seeing the data, they have some pointers which shows that this patient have in increase risk including though he, uh, we don't have here USCR also that would also we should be looking at even with the EGFR 90 patient can have a albuminuria we know that so that should also be looked at so there are multiple pointers then patient have dyslipidemia also because his LDL is more than 70 that is what I would be targeting his BP is also on the higher side so he has some risk factors also but again patient to patient depending on talking to the patient his lifestyle everything would change your second line after metformin would change yes because by giving something at least we can give a lifestyle modification diet modification uh, counseling and wait for his next visit maybe after two months and then the second drugs will be decided i think uh, that will be quite uh, rational and uh, 
it all depends on the clinical decision that we take at that moment right uh, ganapati sir do you agree with um... yeah uh, yeah i do agree uh, i mean uh, regarding the statin part is he is having i think just around 80 or so you control the glucose 10 to 15% reduction in even ldl also happens so even that's also actually not required because control the hyperglycemia tg comes down it improves all these things through we can try some more time the only thing is he's been diabetic for the last 2 years he's already on metformin not following the lifestyle measures 1.3% decrease is a little bit a tougher job for him uh, unless he's significantly overweight uh, we don't have that part so if he was obese yes just that would have been sufficient uh yeah you can get 0.5% which is quite common with an lsm uh 1% possible in a little bit more obese who can put in more effort 1.3 could be a little bit difficult so that's the only thing yeah probably i will uh, see and maybe add this drug later on yeah and just there is one question lacking the how much metformin this patient is getting is it 2 grams or 1 gram or how much yeah it doesn't specify let's assume it's 500 twice a day let's just get the liquid dose of metformin first um the yes. I mean, yes. there are some uh, literature which says doubling the dose will increase the reduce the hba once by just 0.3 to 0.5% so that's also there i mean the usual thing is when we you get 80% of the effect with 50% dose doubling will add an additional 20% probably and just to add on the clinical point i believe the most important thing to ask the patient is whether he is actually taking the medicine or not because many of these patient are non compliant right at the beginning so initial diabetes they think that it will go uh, we can uh, take whatever they want and secondly whether he is following some dietary restriction or not because most of especially in the central part <clears throat> i don't know what is fed in their mind but they believe that jaggery is okay and they can consume however they want whatever they want absolutely true um i think um, rightly said compliance is a major issue and we even find patients who come and ask once the blood sugar comes down oh now the sugar has come down can i stop my medication and some, somehow there's that psychological um, or the social stigma the psychological um, feeling that patients have that taking tablets is not going to have i mean it's probably going to have side but, but what they don't realize is that compliance and adhering to the medication uh, is more important keeping the blood sugar under control is more important to reduce the risk of complications and um, so i think tailor may prescriptions uh, which are evidence based experience based patient centric uh, which um, are effective in glycemic management at the same time well tolerated um, by the patient is uh, the way to go about it and uh, we've discussed both the uh, sort of of course we didn't have uh, the bmi of the patient but we've discussed various options if the patient was um, in a lower side of the bmi or obese what would be the right approach um, and i think uh, we've all agreed that if the patient was overweight or, or more on the higher side the best choice would probably be one of the um, weight loss therapies like an sglt2 would probably be a good choice because sglt2 is also uh, provide benefit in terms of reduction of triglycerides and overall improvement and of course the uh, red blood pressure also blood pressure as well absolutely um and we also discussed that if the patient is more towards the leaner side um we can assume that he's probably insulinopenic uh and um probably initiate something uh, a secreto secretogog would be probably the best way to go about it and in that front we could even consider the dpp4s or a low dose glimepiride um to sort of uh tailor make the prescription and keeping in mind the risk of hypoglycemia uh, to lower the risk as well so i think uh, we've covered quite a bit that was a good discussion i uh, uh, really enjoyed it thank you dr ayushi for uh, having us all here this evening Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Nandita. I'm very well summarized towards the end. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to propose this word of thanks. So I would like to start with time by thanking Dr. Nandita for being so so modest host for the day today's evening. 
Thank you, Dr. Alok, sir, for using all those analogies. Thank you, Dr. Daganapati, sir, for all those pragmatic approaches and Dr. Mayu for all those descriptions of yours. Thank you, all the delegates, for joining us. We had around 1,800 plus logins with us today. And lastly, but not the least, I would like to thank my team, USV, and the digital team for helping us shape this conference and wishing all once again a very happy Doctor's Day and good night, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank, Good night. You. Good night, everyone. thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.